you've heard uh, from Pablo from First and Aldous with the background on our project, and then you've heard from Pablo about all the cool vertical water balance stuff. And now I'm going to expand your level of knowledge on our project by talking about the vegetation, the fuels, as well uh, as a very important and often underrepresented aspect of studies, the below ground. And I always think it's a good idea to start off by giving you a visual of our study area so that you can try and maybe transplant yourself there, see what these forests look like, compare them with what your image or your perspective is based on maybe what your research sites look like. Um, and so here you can see it's definitely a lodgepole pine dominated overstory. We had basically 99% lodgepole pine in our stands. And for people that like to think about eco sites, we're in a UFE 1.1 lodgepole pine green alder feather moss system. So as you can see in our forest floor, it's a medium richness site. Uh, here you can see some fireweed. The tall, um, large shrub over here is the green alder. So of course important for nitrogen fixation in these systems. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other species in the understory as well that I'm going to talk to you more about. So in this presentation, you're going to hear more about the understory and the below ground and the fuels. All this is already given you background context in terms of the overstory. We know that we were successful in simulating a gradient of mountain pine beetle attacks. Again, we didn't necessarily hit the target of 50% and 100%, but we know that mountain pine beetle on the landscape is never going to hit <laughs> an exact number of trees um, to represent a percent percentage anyhow. So we're happy that we captured a gradient of disturbance, which we think is representative of what can realistically happen in this landscape in epidemic levels of mountain pine beetle. And we really want to emphasize, too, that we're just talking about epidemic levels here. We're not looking at those really subtle differences that you might find at a very small spatial scale in a stand that's at really low endemic levels. And of course, these are historically fire-dominated systems. And now, with mountain pine beetle, the disturbance regime in Alberta's pine forest is shifting. And we want to know, well, what are the potential impacts of this shifting disturbance regime? So this leads me to tell you then that I had four main areas of focus for this aspect of my PhD. And so I was first looking at the understory plant community. That's of course going to be very important in determining um, the future regeneration potential of this stand and of this system. So I first looked at the understory plant community composition in terms of the, the non-tree species. And then as well, I looked in particular at the, just at the tree species, because of course that's what, you know, us as uh, thinking about forests, it's the tree species that are going to then drive, well, what's this next forest going to look like if in fact this becomes a new forest. And then another aspect, well, so as the mountain pine beetle kills these trees, over time they're going to first lose their needles, then they're going to lose their branches, eventually these trees are going to fall over. So how's that going to change the fuel dynamics? And that can be thought of from a whole bunch of different perspectives. In particular, we can think about the functional role of down wood um, and snags in terms of habitat for wildlife. Uh, we can think about it in terms of nutrient cycling and putting nutrients back into the system. And of course, from a fire perspective, we can think about, well, what are the impacts in terms of the fuel loading and fire susceptibility of these forests compared with unattacked staff. And then again, like I said, the, the one that we often forget to talk about, but a very important one is to mention and focus on is looking at changes in the below ground dynamics of these systems. We want to think about those properties that are in turn going to, to potentially be altered by the mountain pine beetle. So we want to think about maybe changes in pH. Again, as I mentioned, the needles are going to drop, the branches are going to drop. So this is going to change the litter quantity, the litter quality, and in turn, will that change the nutrient dynamics and in turn change the pH of these systems? as well as the decomposition processes and the microbial community, which is another important driver of the decomposition and nutrient cycling in these forests. So I'm going to go into more detail then on each of those four different aspects of this study. First, I'm going to ask and um, answer what are the differences, if there are any, in terms of the understory plant community composition. And so when I talk about plants, what I did was look to the species level at percent cover within nine one meter by one meter understory quadrats within each of my 12 stands, reminding, remembering that I had those four different treatments replicated three times on the landscape. And then, so what I wanted to look at were different measures of this understory community. I wanted to look at the richness, so how many different plant species did I have, and then their relative abundance within the stands. Um, and as well for the large shrubs, the, the red al or the green alder, sorry, <laughs> that fixes nitrogen, well, how much of that is out there? And does that differ? Because again, it's very important in terms of nutrient cycling. 
So for the, the, the plant people in the room, I just wanted to give you a little bit more insight. Well, how, so when we talk about, well, this is sort of the medium rich site, how much richness, richness are we really talking about? So down to the species, or sometimes just the genre level, um, we had two lichen, eight bryophyte, three club moss, two ferns, six graminoids. We did have one carex, so not just grass beet not just grass species included in there, 22 fork species, 14 shrub species, one large shrub, so the, again the green alder, and five tree species. And so you think, oh, five tree species, we might have some good diversity going on here and that there might be a good future potential, but as you're going to see in coming slides, that's really not necessarily the case. And so, uh, again, we can talk about species richness, we can talk about how many species are out there, but then uh, it's always helpful to actually know, well, what are some of these species? And as I mentioned before, in terms of the ecocyte, this is very much a feather moss dominated system. So you can see there's four dominant feather mosses that really um, encompass the forest floor. And then as well, we have things like bunchberry and rose, um, blueberry, green alder, and uh, the predominant graminoid, or grasses, Kelmogrossus montanensis. So here, I'm going to take a bit of time to explain this graph in more detail because you're going to see a lot, well, not a lot more. We don't want to inundate you with too many graphs or else you're going to start to glaze over and go to sleep despite your caffeine. So here, though, what I'm going to tell you, talk to you first about is that species richness. So how many different species did we have on average in each of our one by one meter quadrats? And remembering what Aldous and Pavlo explained, we had three different um, years over which we did this study. And for the purposes of plants and, and the aspects I was studying, I'm just looking at the growing season. Pavlo also focused on that winter season and looking at the snow, um, snow driven recharge of the system in terms of the hydrology. But for me, I'm just interested in looking at the growing season. So what I did was split and compartmentalize my data into the three different growing seasons. So I had one growing season before the study was um, the study treatments were applied, which I call the pre-treatment year. Then I had the treatment year where I actually applied the studies, and that's the, the white here, so the green is the pre-treatment. And then one year post-treatment in 2010, we have the blue lines. Uh, yeah. And what you'll see here then on the y-axis in this graph, we have species richness, and on the x-axis we have the different treatments. So the control treatment, and these are meant to be in terms of um, order in terms of the relative impact. So we have a reference or control on the left hand side and then a gradient of disturbance levels starting with a 50% kill which we are going to expect has less impact than does the killing all of the trees and then in turn obviously we expect that the clear cut is going to have the most um, impact in terms of short term um, effects on these stands. And so what we see in terms of the species richness here then is basically that we don't have any differences um, amongst the treatments in response to them being applied except for the salvage log stands. As well. So I'm just going to use this one. So here what you see, these different letters represent significant, statistically significant difference between years within that treatment. So here this A, B, B suggests that in the clear cut stands, before we treated these stands, they were the same as all the other stands, but uh, in the treatment year and post-treatment year we saw a decline in the species richness, which of course is probably anybody who's watched out in a clear cut, this isn't going to be surprising news to you. And this is the, we actually saw just a significant difference in that post-treatment year compared with the 100% kill stand. But really the take home message here is just that, that there was a decline in species richness in those salvage log stands. Uh, so yeah, we look first at species richness. As I mentioned, we measure percent cover by species and then I group them by gro growth form. So here what I wanted to show you was the breakdown of those different growth forms in terms of their relative contribution to the overall cover. And again, we're looking at the, the four different levels of treatment, ranging from control to salvage, and breaking it out by the pre-treatment year, the treatment year, and the post-treatment year. And again, the take home message here is overall you, you tend to see um, increase in terms of, in general, across the stands here. What you're seeing then is no significant difference in terms of a treatment response. Instead, instead we likely expect that it's the fact that, um, as you saw in Pablo stands, we had wetter soil moisture in those, in those um, treatment and post treatment years. So that's likely more driving what's happening here as opposed to any treatment effect in this very short term. So instead what we do see is a decline in the percent cover in the salvage log stands and these red stars, up, asterisks up here are meant to indicate which um, of those different growth forms. If we look at what is driving that de overall decrease in understory cover is predominantly the shrubs and the forbs 
that are driving that change. And you can see that in the shift in the yellow, um, as well as the dark, dark intermediate dark green. And the so, What's that? Oh, and the bryophytes, they were borderline significant. They weren't quite, so I put them in gray and know that um, despite it looking like that, it should really be driving it. That was just an um, um, almost significant result. Uh, and here was just a visual. I mean, again, we've all been out in a clear path, so not too surprising. But here you, you can see pretty clear why uh, these were, of course, the more extreme examples, but why you might have a decrease in species richness and a decrease in cover and, a, and an increase in, in your litter cover. So moving on then to the second um, aspect of my study that I was interested in, as I mentioned, I looked at the understory plant community, and then of course I was very much interested in, well, the, the tree species that are in the understory, and what is the future regeneration potential of these stands? That's the question I think we're really asking. What are these forests going to look like in Alberta now that mountain pine beetles come in and attack so many of them? What's the hope of regeneration in these serotonous cones in these, uh, in these historically fire-dominated systems? So originally when I set up the study, I had great intentions to, to actually, um, and I ended up taking some measurements on understory seedlings and saplings that we had in the stand, but it turned out that I was unable to even find five to 10 per hectare within my stand. So that kind of, I had to uh, throw out that because I couldn't really do any, I had no power to actually do my data analysis. But to me that was sort of shocking. I assumed from, from past days in, the, in uh, BC where I had done some work that I would see some pine out there. But, very far and few between. So that then led me to do a germination study in the post-treatment year, and I'm going to talk to you in more detail about that. So as I mentioned, in terms of species richness, we did have five species. We had these four species. We had logical pine, obviously, white and black spruce, and balsam fir, but again, on the magnitude of two to three, maybe, per, per hectare. And as well, we had the odd aspen, as there were some aspen pockets in uh, adjacent regions to our sand. So we have the odd aspen in there as well. But as I mentioned, there's absolutely no way that this, these are going to be able to, to constitute a forest in the future without something happening. So this then led me to do this germination study in the post-treatment year. And I was interested in looking amongst those four different treatments, well, what in terms of the, first off, just is there any differences in those, in those treatments is the most important thing for me. But also, it's the thinking about the availability of these different substrates within those forest types. Again, these are very much feather moss dominated systems, so feather moss isn't necessarily very friendly, um, suitable habitat for germination and then for growth. So um, what, what about the other substrates that are out there? So I looked at five different substrates. I looked at a shallow litter, um, LFH layer. I looked at a deeper LFH layer. As well, I looked at mineral soil. We know that's going to be a pretty good... Um, place to germinate, as well as this um, very decayed dead wood, another one that we know can be quite good for germination, although it also then has the potential to dry out, and so then over the longer term, the seedlings may not survive as well, and then, um, of course, the moss. So then I monitored germination throughout that season in which the seeds were sown. I sowed them in little 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter areas. I sowed 100 seeds, so you can see each of these things that kind of almost look like a little mouse dropping. Um, and then went back, and so here you can see an example of one of my mineral soil plots. And here is one of sort of the best case scenarios where you get to go back one week and you actually see, oh yeah, not only do we have germinates, but you know, there's actually, uh, it's going to take a few minutes uh, or more than a second to count them because overwhelmingly, as you'll see in my coming slides, germination was very, very low. And it was low as we'd expect because we're doing this in a natural system to see what's actually represented out there in the landscape as opposed to conducting a nursery um, and investigate experiment where we would expect to see much higher um, germination rates because it's such a we're controlling so many factors so here you can see the results then from the year in which the germinants were sowed in um, the y-axis we have mean number of germinants again emphasizing how low our germination rates were so we had on the magnitude of between zero and five and on the x-axis here again with that gradient from control to salvage of our treatments and we have the different colors representing the different, um, the different substrate types. And those are also in a gradient of what we'd expect to be the worst germinators to the best. So the moss we expected would be the worst germinator, followed by the deep litter, then the shower, shallow litter, then the decayed wood and the mineral soil. And then what we saw overall is, is that pattern that we'd expect in terms of the relative germination rates within the individual substrates. Uh, but what we didn't see um, really so much was a, a response in terms of the treatment. Although we did see some 
clues that maybe in the 50% and 100% kill that there was increased germination, such as in those, those litter layers compared with the control, and even compared with the salvage. So we thought, well, maybe something is going on there. And so we went back the following year, one year after these were, were sown and germinated, to see what happened in terms of the, the um, environment here. And then what you can see is basically the survival rate is now down in terms of we're talking on the mean number of germinants that have survived that first winter. We're down to one in the, the, all the treatments except for the clear cut, where we have um, on average about two for those the wood and uh, mineral soil. So this we'd suggest is probably not the greatest news in terms of, well, what's the future of these mountain pine beetle stands in the absence, in the absence of um, any kind of active management. And probably what we expect is a likely function, again, we mentioned the light environment. The quality of the light may be changing, but the quant overall quantity of the light isn't yet changing. And so that could be what's contributing to what, what's happened here. And in fact, even if we'd found really high rates of germination for the dead wood and the mineral soil in these 50% kill and 100% kill stands, we have to keep in mind that the availability of those substrates in the short term in these mountain pine beetle attacks is super low. Like, again, the feather-dominated systems, and I really had to, a lot of times I actually had to create miner mineral soil by um, digging down to create my own microsite rather than finding it naturally. So until, um, I think we heard from Kathy Lewis, if you were at the workshop last week, or there's research been done, shows the trees after mountain pine beetle attack don't generally fall down until six to eight years afterwards. So in the short term, there isn't even the availability of those substrates. Anyhow, so maybe as the light environment changes and those trees fall, then there'll be potential in the longer term for germination and uh, recovery, of, uh, regeneration of these stands. So the third component we were interested then was, you know, the downwooding material in these systems. As well, we did look at um, snags. So we did classify in our overstory plots where Aldous presented data on our healthy live basal area tree. Uh, tree basal area. We also have the dead um, trees, and as well, we can look at the decay, the drop rates, as we also um, monitored them in the post-treatment year and, and uh, inventoried which ones had fallen down because they were all tagged. Uh, so again, yeah, these are very much fuel, uh, fire-dominated systems now in, in, with mountain pine beetle coming in, shifting disturbance regimes. What are the impacts in terms of the, the fuels here? So again, another one of these graphs where we're looking at the pre-treatment year, treatment year, and post-treatment year. On the y-axis here, we have the downwooding material in terms of megagrams per hectare, and again, that gradient moving from control to salvage. But one thing you'll, you'll see here, an overall trend, is, is if you look at the across these three years, you just see this overall trending of increase in downwooding material across all the, all the different treatments. And so when we ran the statistical analysis, we actually found out, well, there were no treatment response. In fact, there was just interannual vi variation and differences we saw, as indicated here with the addition of the year on the x-axis that I've added in here. And so there were significant differences or increases in the, the post-treatment year compared with the pre-treatment year, but that was independent of treatment. That was just a general trend in terms of increase. And we speculate that one of the reasons is that, um, again, we had these micro-meteorological towers in, our, in one of our sets of stands, and we did have uh, a lot of extreme wind events in that treatment year and post-treatment year. So again, something else to somewhat con confound and, and the challenges of doing uh, big um, studies is that you have to deal with the uh, real world and what happens. And as well, we had a lot of uh, active management in the area, a lot of clear cutting right around our sites. And, and so some of the wind flow patterns also changed in response. So that could also be a contributing factor. And then in terms of any, we also, you know, I looked at seven different size classes of downwood. And basically what we found is just uh, here we're looking at 0 to 0 0.5 centimeter diameter wood and 0 0.5 to 1 centimeter diameter wood. So those very small, small size classes. So what we see here is in the salvage log stands, after that logging's happened, and we see a pulse in those two, not too surprising. But what was interesting is actually that we didn't see a pulse in terms of any of the larger size classes, despite all that logging activity going in there and some of those pictures I show you. You see a lot of wood in those understory veg plots. You, we would have expected it um, in the other size classes as well, but we didn't. And um, also importantly, we didn't see any response yet in the 50% or the 100%. And it's not really too surprising because we're just in that late green, early red attack. So the needles aren't falling yet, the branches aren't falling. So uh, that's what we found in terms of the downwoody material. So finally, 
uh, the underrepresented uh, below ground that uh, we were also very much interested in looking at. As Pablo showed, we saw some soil moisture changes, especially in a really shallow five centimeter layer. So we'd expect in the short term, despite not having changes in the understory community and in the, in the fuels, that we would see some responses in terms of the nutrient cycling um, below ground, what's happening below ground, because that's very much a soil moisture driven system in a lot of aspects. So we wanted to look further at this and I studied a variety of attributes of the below ground to try and capture some of this, um, any of these differences that might have happened. So I looked at things like decomposition, pH, soil moisture, the nutrient availability of a suite of macronutrients and micronutrients using a technique called the, the plant root simulator, or PRS probes, that some of you may be familiar with. If you have more questions, I can ask or I can answer them. Um, and as well, the microbial community, which is, can be a very good indicator of the, of the system and how well it's functioning. And I'll go into more detail in terms of the analysis coming up in some slides. But what we found with a lot of things is that even in the short term, despite seeing a response in the, in the soil moisture that Pablo saw in that five centimeter, that we're not seeing yet a lot of changes in, in a lot of these below ground attributes either. So here you can see uh, percent decomposition of these cellulose filter papers that we buried at the forest floor mineral soil interface. Again, with this gradient of control of salvage. And the take-home message here is that we don't see any inherent pattern in any of those treatments in terms of decomposition. If we look at soil pH, this is an example where sometimes uh, you can get a statistically significant result. Um, as we did find, again, we had interannual differences in terms of our pH. So you can see, too, the pH of these stands is between 3 to 4 for the forest floor. So these are very much very acidic um, forest floor. So these would be very much fungal dominated, slower decomposing compared to, let's say, a, a hardwood stand. And we did see, um, even before we started out, again, very subtle differences amongst our different stand types. Um, or treatments independent of year. So the take home message here is that in terms of pH, we saw some statistically significant differences, but we didn't see any response to our treatments being applied. And again, like these very small, low, um, num low changes in the pH are likely not to really gonna expect it to biologically change things much. Um, and in terms of soil moisture, again, that soil moisture, the way I measured it, um, was different than um, on a landscape scale and in terms of the uh, number of times I measured it each season compared with Pablo. So I, I found slightly different findings. But what I did see for, for soil moisture at 20 centimeters depth, 40 centimeters depth, and 60 centimeters depth was um, interannual variation. Again, wetter years in the treatment year and the post-treatment year compared with the pre-treatment year. So that does match up with what, what uh, Pablo saw in terms of the overall trend of, of the being wetter in the, in the later years of our study. And then so uh, for the soil nutrient supply rate, so here you can see an example of one of these PRS probes. You put that into the, um, in perpendicular to the, vertically into the forest floor, um, and then, sorry, into the mineral soil. And uh, there's anion exchange membranes and cation exchange membranes. There's orange probes and purple probes. You put a set of these in your one by one meter quadrat, then you clean them up, and then the nice thing about them, in my opinion, is that you can then get to ship them off to Saskatchewan, and then you get a bunch of numbers back. And uh, what it, we found, though, is that you get, we basically didn't see any response to our treatments in this, again, short term. So again, these are sort of the kinds of things that we have to wait until later. So we didn't see any differences in terms of our phosphate or nitrogen, even in a lot of these micronutrients, things such as aluminum and manganese. We only saw interannual variability. So that seems to be a sort of a recognition. There's a lot of variability from year to year, but the signal of our treatments is not yet um, overcoming that interannual differences that we see. And because we know these systems are new, nitrogen limited, just wanted to give you an example then of one of these graphs and show you ammonia and again showing that we don't see any inherent pattern in our treatments although we do start to see uh, an increase in the salvage log stands which is what we'd expect based on the assart effect and the flush of nutrients that we have happen in a system after the trees are harvested and removed so we start to see that so again I think as the study progresses out over time then we're going to start to actually see the significance of those findings um, but here what we see is basically a, a difference between the treatment year and uh, the pre-treatment year in terms of ammonia, but no treatment responses. 
And then finally, we were interested in looking at the microbial community, and some of you may not be too familiar with this kind of analysis and how it works, so just uh, wanted to give you a, a little bit more background in terms of the microbial community. So we looked at two different aspects of the microbial community. We were interested in looking at the phospholipid fatty acid analysis, because back microbes um, tend to have these phospholipid fatty acid chains that are 20 carbons or less. And yeah, that part's not so important, but the take-home message is we can identify these different phospholipid fatty acids based on the signature of their, um, of their cell membrane, and then that can tell us, well, how many different kinds of um, microbes do we have out there in terms of their composition. So we can sort of use that as, sur as a surrogate for how much structural diversity do we have in that microbial community. And we can also use it as an uh, absolute, uh, or as an estimate of the biomass of the microbial community. And as well, we looked at the respiration rates, and we're interested in, in different carbon sources. You know, we know there's various um, chemicals that are associated with plant root exudates, and so we're interested in, well, are there certain microbes that are gonna, gonna respire and eat those more so than other microbes? So um, give us some information on that. So we also looked at the substrate-induced respiration for these different um, microbes in these different treatments as well. So here's an example just to give you an idea of this respiration. So we put these soils into these 96 well plates, and then we seal them with these colored, um, colored gel up here. They start out as yellow. We leave them for six hours in the dark and incubate them. And then over time, they turn to this really pretty pink color. We read them, and then we can then um, do a bunch of calculations to get CO2 rates. So that's how we get our six hours of respiration. And that gives us the insight into the function of this microbial community and what's happening with it and how diverse are the microbes there in terms of what they're eating. And so the take home message here you're getting familiar with is this interannual variability. So just to keep this very simple, this is an ordination plot, but all you need to know is that points closer together are more similar than points further apart. And here all I've done is colored the different boxes by the year, so these samples in black represent the post-treatment year, the ones in red represent the treatment year, and the ones in white represent the pre-treatment year. And here all, all the take-home messages here is that when we look at those 15 different substrates and the basal respiration of these, of these different samples amongst the years, we see that there's interannual variability there. So there's different, different communities in the different years. But if we actually looked further within the treatments, we didn't see any response to the treatments among the years. And so then finally, we looked at the phospholipid fatty anal acid analysis. So what we were trying to do is figure out, well, what are the different kinds of microbes that are in there? You can think of this more as a fingerprint of that profile of that community in terms of its composition of the microbes. And the take home message here, uh, in this particular graph, we're looking at the microbial biomass. So here we have the total biomass in animals per gram. Again, on the x-axis, the, the gradient of treatments. And the take home message here is that there's really no apparent pattern amongst those treatments. And what we found was, again, a differences amongst the years. So we had a difference between the pre-treatment year and the treatment year, intermediate levels in the post-treatment year. And we looked at a whole bunch of different um, aspects of the microbial um, PLFA stuff, but I don't want to go into too much detail. But we can look at certain signature ones that give indicators for like actino or um, mycorrhizae um, and things like that. And again, we didn't see any differences except interannual differences in any of those either. So then, well, finally, we can get then to what are the take home messages from this? I think what we really want to emphasize is the, the yet in terms of no changes, because we are looking in the very short term, and uh, as Barry pointed out, we're graduate students, we don't want to be here for 10 years doing our PhDs, we look forward to moving on to, to other things, but somebody has to do all the dirty work to set up a really cool long-term study, so uh, the good news is that there's going to be really cool results, I think, <laughs> I hope, coming down the, down the pipeline, but, excuse me, but in the short term, we haven't really seen any of those changes happening yet. And that's, of course, in the context of mountain pine beetle. We did see these effects in the short term in the salvage, but those are all what we'd expect and, and weren't really too surprising. So I want to really emphasize here that, yes, these stands appear to be resistant, but you know, we're not naive and thinking, well, this is just going to keep going over the longer term and that these systems are going to stay resistant. We very much think that this is a short-term resistance and, therefore, this has very much been set up as a longer-term a longer study so that we can then take this out in time, 
longitudinally and get a lot more information in terms of, well, what happens as we tr transition to later red attack, then the needles start to fall and we transition to gray attack. So we know the trees are dying, and we know as time continues, what we're going to hopefully see next is the fall of these needles, the branches, and eventually the trees. This in turn is, um, as we're already seeing, going to increase soil, new soil water. Then we're going to hope in turn that this also increases the soil nutrients, and of course is going to increase the light, change the light quality. There's going to be understory um, species-specific responses. Some species are going to do really well in this new environment and uh, we're going to see pulses or increase in their cover. Of course, there's going to be other species that are not, you know, as adapted to these, these changes in terms of the nutrients in the light environment. They're going to not do so well. So overall, we're going to expect to see a shift in the understory community, although we're not exactly sure what that shift's going to look like. And again, we're also going to expect a shift in terms of the microbial community and all those properties in the below ground um, that are happening. And in terms of regeneration, we're not really sure, well, what does that mean? And so that's really an area that we want to uh, focus on and have study. Because I think for everyone in this room, we're really like, well, what is the future of these forests in Alberta in the face of mountain pine beetle? Because we know mountain pine beetle is most likely not going anywhere, and we already have it in a huge area of our stand, so we really have to know, well, what's going to happen next? And so I just want to push, and Helen's going to um, have some more slides to follow up, but just to really emphasize the, the need for this long-term research and monitoring, because that is something that, again, we struggle to get grants that will fund us for even five years of the duration of a PhD project, but really the more interesting questions, they come over time. I know if anyone was at the workshop last week, we heard from Renee Alfaro talking about some stands in Waterton, I think it was 29 years after attack, and, and they're still seeing evident changes um, in those systems that much time after, and you look in the literature, and there's changes even they can see 80 years out. So, so we want to really make sure to, to keep thinking about these. Um, these kind of studies and, uh, and uh, be important to focus on well, what is the future of forest management in Alberta. So with that, I'll be happy to take your questions and of course, importantly, most importantly, acknowledge all the people. I'm the one standing up here, but without uh, the great assistance of so many people and so many funding sources, we wouldn't be here to talk to you. Thank you.